You all can hear me now, right? Awesome. Now I just get to wear this thing for like jewelry-ish <laughs> circumstances. Hey, guys, uh, I don't know who was here the last time I was here, but I'm so glad that I get to be back with you guys. Um, I've been here since I think Thursday, right? Thursday? I, yeah, Thursday. And so I've had the opportunity to, to talk with some of your staff and then some of your leaders. And it has really been such a great time. Like, I'm not just saying that because I'm the guest speaker coming in. Like, I actually really enjoyed being with uh, all of you guys and, and, and hearing some of the stories and, and all of those sorts of things. And if this is your first time to Hope Point or if this is your first time in a long time, the bad news is that I'm preaching today and you're not getting to hear from Pastor Warren or Pastor Beck. But the good news is I'm speaking today and next week, I'm going to be gone. And so Pastor Warren and Pastor Beck will be back. And, and yesterday, it, you know, it's funny. Yesterday, we, we did, a, we did a, a church leadership thing. And it was really the first time that I got to hear both Pastor Beck and Pastor Warren preach. And, man, they're really good. They're so, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. So good. And so after hearing both of their sessions, like I said to my wife when we got back to the hotel, I said, uh, now they're going to have to put up with me. Like, I feel like, uh, you know, I said to her, you know, I remember this time when, when I was growing up and my brother and I broke a window in our house. You know, the, the whole window pane broke and, and shattered. Oh, we're going to go back? Oh, I get to be Britney Spears again. That's awesome. Um, or Madonna? Christian says I'm more Madonna. Um, yeah, so I said to my wife, I, I feel like that time when my brother and I broke the window at our house, you know, and, and the whole pane shattered, and, and because, you know, my parents had to order this new pane in, uh, they put up, do you, does anybody still do this? They put up a sheet of plastic? Yeah. Like, it wasn't the real window pane, it was just this sheet of, like a pretend. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> like, the window's broken, you're not getting the real gl glass, pane of glass, you're getting the plastic version. So I was telling my wife that, and she said, don't worry about it, Dave, you are a real pain. <laughs> and, and I was like, I, I think I know what you mean, but that was kind of hurtful. Um, so, so yeah, I came here last time, and I think I shared some of my story with you, but just for the thumbnail for the people who weren't here, um, I used to be a TV reporter in Melbourne, Austra uh, Australia. I'm used to saying Melbourne, Australia. I used to be a TV reporter on Channel 10 in Melbourne uh, for a show called Sports Tonight. Does everybody remember that? All the older people go, yeah, and it's always the older guys go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Came on after Sandra Sully. Um, and so I did that for a long period of time, and then God called me into ministry, and I moved my family. I quit my career and moved my family over to the U.S. of all places, and, and um, we moved to a place called New Jersey, and we went to a church there, and I became an online and social media pastor. And that was in 2008, just when we were getting out of, of dial-up internet. And um, uh, all my friends who were around, I... I we, I, you know, I got to know all the online pastors at the time, and I was the eighth online pastor in the world. Because back in 2008, online was just this fad thing that we did. And then COVID hits, and live stream becomes mainstream, and every church is doing it, and now every, everybody wants a, an online pastor, everybody wants a social media pastor. So I've been doing that for, since 2008, so about 14 or so years in full-time ministry, and now my family and I have moved back to Australia, and we get to be here, and we get to help churches like Hope Point um, with not just their social media and online stuff, but also just uh, their culture and, and how we're going further into the community. And I'm going to say we a lot when I talk about Hope Point, because I feel like we're I feel like we're adopted family members. Can I say that? We, I, my, my wife and I feel like we're adopted family members here because we love it so much and we, we love all of you guys. Um, but the thing is, while, while I'm kind of still relatively new here and while, you know, technically I am still a guest um, and I don't really know most of you, there is something that I know for sure about all of you. There's one thing that I know is true about everybody who's in this room, everybody who's watching online. There's one thing that I know is true about all of you. And I know this is true about all of you because it's true of me. And it's true of everyone that I know. And I'm sure it's true of you too. And this is not a Christian thing. This is not a church thing. This is a human thing. This is just a thing. And the thing that I know about all of us is this. You want to get life right. 
right? You want to get life right. You want to get every aspect of your life right. You want to get it as right as you possibly can, whatever that looks like. If, if you're in a relationship, you want to get that relationship right. If you're a parent, you want to get your parenting right. If, you're, if you've got a job, you want to get your job right. When it comes to money, you want to get your money, your budget, your finances right. When it comes to our health, we all want to get our health right, or at least as right as we can. If you're married, you want to get your married life. The point is, we all, every single one of us, this is the thing I know about all of you, not only do you want to get your life right, but we all want to get our lives right. We all want to get life right. I mean, nobody really ever sits at home and says, geez, I wonder how I can really mess up my life today. <laughs> really? I'm going to make a list of all the bad things, all the wrong things, all the th bad decisions I could make. None of us do that because we all want to get life right. And while we don't want to sabotage our life, the truth is when it comes to life, we don't get any do-overs. Do you remember when you were playing sport in like school, like at recess, you'd all run out and you'd play kickball or you'd play cricket or something like that. And if you're playing cricket, somebody would bowl the ball and you'd get out and you didn't want to be out. So you'd yell out do over or something along those lines. And, and, and the whole game would stop and you got a chance to have a second turn at it. Yeah. Do you remember that? Life doesn't give us any of those. Life doesn't give us a do over. Or if you play golf, any golfers here today? I know there are some go golfers here today. In golf, you call that a mulligan, right? You golfers, have you heard of the term mulligan? See, mulligan, if you, for the uninitiated golfers, a mulligan is actually a Latin term that means I'm going to take another shot and not put it on the scorecard and basically <laughs> cheat, but you can't say anything because I called it a mulligan. And you get to do that shot over again. Life isn't like that. Wouldn't life be awesome? <laughs> if we could just call a mulligan? If you look back on your life and you think of all of those times when something went wrong, that, that conversation you had with that person that totally put a division and a gap between you and it's never quite been restored, wouldn't you love to go back and call a mulligan? So can we just have a do-over on that? Or that time you screwed up at work and they had to let you go as a result of something that you did wrong. Don't you wish you could go back and say, can, that, can I just get a mulligan on that? Can I get a mulligan on the last six months that led up to that situation? Or that time you were driving and you were going a little bit too fast and the speed camera got you and you got that letter in the mail and you'd lost all those demerit points and had to pay that fine. Don't you wish you could write back to the police and say, hey, mulligan, <laughs> mulligan, I need a do-over on that one. Wouldn't that be awesome if in life we could have a mulligan, if in life we could have a do-over? It would be incredible. But unfortunately, there aren't any do-overs in life. We need to get life right from the beginning, right? We need to do our best to get life right. And we all know this because the truth is that getting life right today determines if life is going to be right tomorrow. Getting your life right today will determine if, getting, if life is going to be right for you tomorrow. And getting life right today is important because tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is always coming. And if you get life, life right today, it is absolutely going to impact your tomorrow. But that's the hard part about life. The hard part is when you're in the middle of your life and you're living your life, you don't know if you're getting it all right. You don't know if everything is going as planned or as you really wanted it to, to be. In fact, sometimes you're not really sure if you're getting life right until you get it wrong. And then you can look back and say, I wasn't getting life right and now I'm gonna make a 180 degree turn and I'm gonna start doing something different in order to get my life right. We all want to get life right, but it's hard for us to know whether or not we're actually achieving that goal that we all have. And the only way we're really going to know is if we wait a few years 
and we can look back and cross our fingers and look back and see our relationship, see our career trajectory, see our um, living situation, and then we'll know whether or not we were getting life right a few years ago. We have to look back in order to know if we're getting it right. Well, what if there was a way for all of us to know that we're getting life right? What if there was a way to know that as far as our life depends on us, depends on our actions, depends on our decisions, depends on our words, what if there was a way that as far as it depends on us, we could be aware that we were getting life right? Wouldn't you want to know what that life hack is? Wouldn't you want to know what that tip is? What if there was a, a way to know that you did your best in the moment that you were doing it, that that was as good as it was going to get and you were going to live your best life right now? And what if this is not only this hack, this tip, not only made your life better, like not only made you better and your life better, but it also helped you impact the lives of the people you love most and the people who love you most and also the people in your local community? What if there was a way to know for sure that the things you could do that you're currently doing would make your life better, make the lives of the people you love most better, and make your community better as well? Now, I don't think it matters today if you're a Christian or a follower of Jesus or if you're just somebody who got dragged to church today because somebody said, oh, I'm going to buy you lunch afterwards if you come with me. It doesn't matter if you're only watching online because you made a promise to your mom or to your wife that you would watch online today. This thing, this topic, this conversation matters to everybody. It doesn't matter where you stand on the faith spectrum. We all want to get life right, right? Right? So what if today I said to you, by the end of this message, in the next 15 minutes, I was going to give you a life hack that I've learned that has helped me know that I'm getting life right. If I told you that today, by the, end, by the time you walked out into the car park, you would have one tip, one hack, one thing you could do that would guarantee you that you, you would know that you're getting your life right. Would you want to know what that tip is? Well, that's what I'm going to try and do today. Now, I first heard about this hack, I first heard about this tip when I was in high school. But if I'm really honest with you, I heard about it then when I was in grade 11. I knew about it, I thought I understood it, but what I found out was I actually didn't really understand it, and I certainly didn't apply it until I was into my 40s, until I'd been a full-time pastor for a number of years. That was when I realized this tip could actually work. That was when I fully understood the impact that this life could have on me. But I can honestly tell you today that if you apply this hack in the same way that I have, and, and I speak from experience here, I can honestly tell you that this hack, this tip, has made my life better and made me better at life. This one thing has made my life better and made me better at life. It's made me a better dad, it's made me a better husband. It's made me a better friend. It's made me a better member of our community. It, it has impacted every life, every part of my life, and I believe it can impact yours as well. And I learned this tip from the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was this first century Jewish guy who was super, super smart, super insightful. I mean, he was so insightful that he wrote a whole bunch of different letters to a whole bunch of different people and different places, but they were so helpful, they were so insightful that in the first century when they were written, people gathered them together and said, these are so important, we have to protect them, we have to restore them, we have to maintain these letters because they're so insightful and so helpful to making our lives better. So they did. This first century, these first century communities kept these letters and they eventually became part of what we call the Bible. But the funny thing is that when this guy, Paul, when we first hear about this guy, Paul, in the pages of history, what we learn is he was someone who hated Christians. He was somebody who, was, who just didn't trust anyone who followed Jesus. And so if you're here today, 
because you got dragged to church, or if you're here today and you're not sure if you can trust church people, or if you're not sure if you can trust uh, followers of Jesus, if you're watching online and you're sitting there thinking, I don't know if I can trust Christians, you're going to really relate to what Paul has to say, because Paul's your guy. He felt exactly the same way as you might. So one of these letters that Paul wrote that got protected and maintained, he wrote to a close friend of his named Timothy. Now, Timothy and Paul, they had traveled the world together. They'd done cruise ships and Contiki tours, and they'd gone to all these fascinating places, and because they'd gone and traveled together, they were really tight. But more than that, Paul was Timothy's mentor. Paul was somebody that Timothy looked up to. And there was a certain time in in their friendship when Paul decided he wanted to let his friend Timothy know exactly what I'm talking about today. He wanted to let Timothy know how to get life right. So I'm going to read something in a minute. And as, as I read this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine yourself writing a letter or a text or an email to one of, you know, if you're a parent to one of your kids, maybe to a younger niece or a nephew or a a younger cousin, I want you to imagine that you're writing to somebody who looks up to you, and I I want you to imagine what would you write to somebody who looks up to you, who's younger than you, to give them advice about how they should live their life, okay? Because this is what Paul is doing with Timothy right here. So, Paul is writing this letter to somebody who's looking up to him, who's a really close friend, and he wants to impart some wisdom to him about how Timothy can get his life right. So basically what he does, he writes to Timothy and he says, Timothy, if you want to get life right, here's what you need to do. And we read this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and it says this, Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. That was Paul's advice to Timothy about how Timothy can get his life right. He kind of writes him like a, it's almost like a bullet point or a shopping list of things. Hey, Timothy, you want to get life right? Pursue righteousness. Check. A God, pursue a godly life. Check. Have faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. This is like a bullet list of things that Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy about how Timothy can get his life right. And because uh, Paul was so smart and Paul was so insightful around the world and around life, Timothy is is wanting to get this information from him. And today specifically, I want to focus on just the very first part of this advice. In fact, I just want to focus on the first word of this advice. Well, it's actually the second word of this advice. It's that word righteousness. Because this is not a word that we typically use or typically hear in modern day language, in regular conversation. You don't really hear the word righteousness unless you're a surfer from the 90s or unless you're some sort of mutant turtle who has righteous ninja skills. They're the only times you might have heard the word righteous. All the older folks laughed at that because they understood my reference. But if you grew up in church, If you've been around Jesus' people for a while, you've probably heard this word righteousness before. And Paul knew that his friend Timothy had heard and used and understood this word righteousness before because this idea of pursuing righteousness, chasing after righteousness, is found throughout the Jewish Bible. And and because Timothy and Paul were such good friends, they'd, they'd read and studied the Scriptures together Paul had imparted his wisdom about what he knows about faith and about Jesus and about God to, Paul, uh, to Timothy. And so Paul knew that Timothy understood what this word righteousness means, but some of us might not understand. So the question today is, what is righteousness? What is this word righteousness? I didn't grow up in church. In fact, I didn't start uh, following Jesus until I was in year 11 at school. And so I had never heard this word before, but when I started going to church and everybody started throwing around this word righteousness, I started to formulate my own thinking about what I thought it meant because nobody sat down and actually told me what it meant. So I had this idea that because it came from the Bible, 
Righteousness, being righteous, must mean knowing a lot of Bible verses and, and, and not doing those things that were against God. That was my initial early definition of what righteousness was. And then as I you know, started to learn a few things and grow up, what I started to think righteousness meant was that it meant to have a, a right or a correct way of thinking and to have a right standing before God. If I lived my life in such a way that things between God and I were okay and my standing with God was right, then I was being righteous and I had righteousness. But then about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to, to sit down and, and have regular coffee conversations with a Orthodox Jewish rabbi in the town that I lived in, in New Jersey. Rabbi Lubin and I would get together and we would have coffee and, I mean, the coffee that he made, you all would just be, you'd be devastated with, seriously. The, the, the people who are making the coffee out there, coffee is spot on. <laughs> this coffee was the hottest cup of water I've ever had in my life. It was the darkest, thickest, it was like tar. And you know when somebody makes really, really hot, strong, black coffee that you, yeah, and you don't ask Rabbi Lubin for milk, that's bad enough, but then they put it right to the brim. And so even <laughs> just picking it up while sitting down, you, it's burning your finger. Like, it was, that one, that's one of the things I remember most about him. But the other thing I remember was he started to teach me some Hebrew words and some Hebrew concepts that really unpacked for me this idea of righteousness. And, and, and one of the first words he taught me was this, the Hebrew word, that we translate in our Bibles as righteousness. The word is actually tzedakah. Tzedakah. Can everybody say that? Tzedakah. Online, I want you to put into the chat what you, how you think tzedakah should be spelled. <laughs> tzedakah. And he told me that this word, righteousness, tzedakah, was it literally translated to, to compassion, generosity, but more specifically, he said it translated to to help people in need. That was the idea. In fact, to this day, if you go into a synagogue, there will usually be sadaka boxes on the walls on the way out so that people can go in and put money inside. And if you're somebody in need in the community, you can go into the synagogue, open that box up because it's not locked, and take the money out as a way of receiving charity from the people who attend that synagogue. And it's called a sadaka box because that idea of sadaka means to show compassion, to show concern for the poor and for people in need, to show charity, to be generous. That's what it means to be righteous. It's about serving the least the last and the lost. And according to Paul, if you want to get life right, you need to pursue opportunities where you're being generous, showing compassion, showing charity, showing selflessness. That's how you make a difference with your life. That's how you make a difference in your relationships. And that's how we make a difference as a church in our community by pursuing opportunities to show compassion and mercy and generosity and love and support and to serve the people around us. In fact, if this is your first time in church or your first time in a long time, I, I, I just wanna take a minute just to speak to just the Christians who are in the room. If you're one of those people who got bribed with lunch to come to church today, if you got dragged here or your mom sent you the link online, you can check out for a second, okay? You probably already have, but you now have my permission to check out. But you're going to want to come back in towards the end because I've got something to say to you guys as well. But for a moment, I just want to talk to the people who, who are Christians in the room, and specifically, even more specifically, the people who call Hope Point home. If this is the church that you are members of, if this is a church that you learn about your faith from, if this is the church that you come to regularly, I specifically want to talk to you guys for just a second. This idea, guys, this idea of pursuing opportunities to be generous, to, being, to pursuing, to looking out for, to chasing after opportunities to serve and care for and love and welcome the people who live within driving distance of this building, this is what's going to ensure that the local community knows our church is here, that the local community is happy that our church is here, and that the local community is better yeah. 
because our church is here. And don't we want that? Don't we want the local community to know we're here? Don't we want the local community to be happy that we're here? And to be different, to be better, because we are here? You see, I truly believe this, guys. I truly believe that if you want to make a difference in the world, you have to be different from the world. And pursuing opportunities, searching for places and situations to be generous, to be compassionate, to be helpful, that is being different from the world. That's what we see in the life of Jesus. And that's what Paul is reflecting to his friend Timothy. Paul is saying, all of the scriptures talk about this. All of the people I've talked to about Jesus say that he exemplified this. And so if you want to get your life right, you need to pursue these opportunities as well. You need to chase after. You need to live life, not with your head down, especially in the modern world, not with our heads down, but with our eyes up, looking for people in need and figuring out ways we can serve them, figuring out ways we can help them. Pursuing opportunities like this for places and situations to be generous is different from the world. And being generous, being compassionate, being charitable, being righteous is different because generosity is not natural. Generosity is not natural. It's not. We have to be taught to be generous. If you've got kids, <laughs> you know this. Your kids do not come out of the womb generous, <laughs> ready to share their stuff, ready to show compassion and mercy, and, and, and they, they don't come out of the womb helpful, <laughs> right, parents? They, you have to teach your kids to share. Why? Because there's a lot of things that don't, there are a lot of things that do come naturally, but generosity and compassion and servanthood are not one of those things. Now, I'm sure that we all do generous things, especially those of you in the room who follow Jesus. I'm sure you're all like, I do lots of generous things. I show lots of compassion. And from time to time, that's probably true. And for people to people, it's probably true as well. But I'm talking about being generous, not doing generous things. I'm talking about being compassionate, being merciful, not doing things that are compassionate and uh, merciful. There, that's a big difference for somebody to define you as that person is charitable, that person is helpful, that person is compassionate. So I'm not talking about doing, I'm talking about being. And the great thing about this, the great thing about this idea of pursuing righteousness, pursuing tzedakah, is something that's so easy, you can all do it today. And it would be really simple to do. Living your life in such a way that you are ready, willing, and able to be compassionate, to be generous, to be supportive, to be helpful, to be merciful, you can start that right now. Because it might be as simple as sending a text, sending a text of encouragement to somebody who you know needs it right now, sending a text that says, hey, I'm thinking of you, sending a text that says, hey, I'm praying for you. Most of my family are unchurched. My wife and I have a real passion. We are unapologetically wired to chase after unchurched people. We love being with them. We love hanging out with them. We love having conversations with them. And, and I know, for example, I might send my sister-in-law, who is, is unchurched and, and doesn't just, is, is not just ambivalent about churches, kind of antagonistic towards church, I will send her a text from time to time and say, hey, I know this doesn't, I know you don't believe in it, and it might not mean much to you, but I just want you to know I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you today. And there has never been a time where she wrote back and said, that sucks, that's terrible, don't ever do that. <laughs> she always writes back and says, thank you, because I know how much that means to you. And it means a lot to me that you're even thinking of me. And usually I'll follow up with, well, as I'm talking to God about you, what do you want me to say? <laughs> well, you know, something that works going bad. So this is a, a, a woman who doesn't pray, doesn't have any faith, but she knows that it's important to me and she receives that gift of compassion and mercy. She knows that she's loved and she's welcomed by a simple text. 
all it takes is a text. Being charitable, being generous, being righteous can start with a text. It might, might mean being generous with your time by asking a person in need out for a cup of coffee and asking to hear their story. How often in life do you get asked, hey, tell me, tell me about the story of your weekend or, or tell me your story. How, why do you feel that way? Why do you think that way? Being compassionate can be as simple as that, giving up some of our time. It might be actively looking for opportunities to serve other people. For some of you, it might be serving or, or, or giving to a charity or a mission that is serving the local community. That might be the best way for you to, to show some compassion. These are the things that will make your life better. That's what will make this church better. And that's what will make this community better. I really believe that getting life right can start today. Getting life right can start right now. Because can you imagine? Like, just imagine with me for a second. Can you imagine what the world would be like if every person on the planet who calls themselves a follower of Jesus was known more for their compassion, more for their generosity than anything else? Yeah. Could you imagine what the world would be like if people who say they follow Jesus were known for how generous and compassionate and merciful and welcoming and loving they were? Could you imagine how different that would be, how different the world would be right now? Can you imagine what this community would be like? Yeah. George's Hall, yeah. Bankstown. Can you imagine what these communities would be like if every follower of Jesus pursued chased after, sought out, actively went in search of opportunities to help people around us who are in need. Could you imagine what this community would be like if that was the case? Can you imagine if when the people who live within driving distance of this building, when the parents who are dropping their kids off in this vicinity, when, can you imagine if when they think, <laughs> when they think of Hope Point, their first thoughts are, I sometimes hear them singing those weird songs about Yahweh or something, and I don't know what that's all about, but man, they are the most compassionate, generous community that we have in this local area. Could you imagine if that was your reputation when they thought of this church? If they thought of this church and they said, I don't know if I agree with everything they go on about about this Jesus fella, but man, I want to hire somebody from Hope Point because they are the best people in our community. They are the most servant-natured, the most compassionate, the most helpful, the most generous, the most humble people in our community. Could you imagine if the parents who live within driving distance of this building, when they think of Hope Point, they think, I don't know what they're going on about about this living forever, after death, heaven thing, but I want my child... I want my son, I want my daughter to marry somebody from that church because they could use a little bit more charity in their life, a little bit more compassion in their life, a little bit more helpfulness in their life, a little bit more servanthood in their life. Could you imagine if that was our reputation? How do we get that reputation? How do we get that? It starts by us being people who represent that. It starts with us being charitable helpful, compassionate, for us to think through the lens of how do I serve the people around me right now? How do I be helpful to the people around me right now? How do I have eyes to see when I'm walking around just in my everyday life, whether I'm in an office, a factory, a restaurant, when I'm at the supermarket, when I'm, when I'm driving? How do I be more compassionate when I'm driving? How do I be more charitable, more helpful, more servant-natured when that guy's trying to cut me off? <laughs> We've got a fish sticker on our car. <laughs> Take it off. I assume you're talking about the sticker, not me. If you want to get, guys, if you want to get your life right today, it starts with this word, sadaka, to pursue opportunities to be righteous. I imagine when Timothy read this letter from Paul, 
and he started reading through these words, and he read that first opening statement of pursue righteousness. My, my thought is that he probably started to think through all of the other things he'd learned throughout his school, which was based on the Hebrew Bible. His pr- mind probably went to the Bible, the, the, the Hebrew, authors of the Hebrew Bible tell me that God loves the righteous. God loves those who pursue opportunities to help others. He pro- his mind probably went to verses that talk about how God will remember the prayers of the righteous, those people who are seeking opportunities to serve the people around them. And that probably drove home this idea that my life will be better. My life can get better, and I can get life right today if I start pursuing, chasing after, seeking out opportunities to show compassion and to be helpful to the people around us. The question I think we need to be asking is, how do we pursue righteousness? How do we pursue those opportunities to be generous, to be helpful today? How do we do that? And how, what does that look like for you in your context of your everyday life or your family? God, I wanna thank you that you are a generous God. You're a God who showed us compassion and mercy even when, even when we didn't even know that we needed it. But you pursued those opportunities for us. And that is, God, I know for me that has made my life better and it's made me better at life. And I know for the people who are watching online, who are in this room, who are participating in this church, who are listening to a podcast or watching a video weeks, months, years from now, God, I believe that you are pursuing opportunities to be compassionate with them as well. Father, would you help us to be people who are known for our righteousness, who are known for our ability to be compassionate and generous and merciful and helpful. Help us to be servants, God. Help us to be servants because your son modeled that best of all. So help us to serve in any way that we can and help us to have eyes to see the opportunities of the people in need around us as we go about our day to life. We pray all of this in the amazing, compassionate, generous, righteous name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen.